<laughs> so thank you everyone for coming. My name is Patrick Allison Jr. I am the Youth Education Coordinator for the East Quad, uh, East Quad and Land Trust in Hardwick, Massachusetts. And I am serving with TerraCorps slash AmeriCorps. And I have just like a quick little background. Um, I graduated my undergraduate in um, Southeastern Pennsylvania from Delaware Valley University. And I have my master's degree that I just earned last May from West Liberty University um, in West Liberty, West Virginia. And my main specialization is crayfish, but I love all freshwater macro invertebrates in general. So today we're going to pretty much be going over some of the aquatic insects and just like a basic introduction for freshwater macro invertebrates. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be going over freshwater mussels and crayfish. So let's get things started. So what exactly are freshwater macroinvertebrates? Freshwater macroinvertebrates are small organisms that we can see without a microscope. So we have a whole bunch of freshwater macroinvertebrates in this Petri dish. And we can see them with the naked eye. So I don't need something like a microscope to be able to see the critters that are in this Petri dish. However, that doesn't mean that like something like a dissecting microscope right here isn't going to aid us in better identifying the freshwater macros that we're looking at. Freshwater macroinvertebrates lack an internal skeletal system, so they have an external skeletal system, the exoskeleton. Um, insects and crustaceans are going to have a chitin exoskeleton. So when they grow too big, they have to shed or molt their exoskeleton so that they can continue to grow. Versus something like the mollusks have a calcium carbonate exoskeleton that they keep secreting calcium carbonate and expanding their shell that way. Freshwater macroinvertebrates live in or partially in water their entire lives. So we have an example right here of a freshwater mussel that is going to be living the entirety of its life underwater versus right here we have a mayfly where when it's younger, it's going to be living underwater but when it becomes a mature adult, it ends up moving to the terrestrial ecosystem where it flies around um, for the rest of its life. So why should we care about freshwater macroinvertebrates? Aquatic macroinvertebrates are playing important roles in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems, but then they're also very important for human recreational activities such as fly fishing. So if we look here at this basically food pyramid, we can see the macro invertebrates are right in here. And if we end up pulling this part of the pyramid out, we're going to completely cause a collapse of the ecosystem because we are missing that vital part right in here that helps transfer this energy up the food chain and acts as a food source for whether it be aquatic animals or even terrestrial animals that can move about from different systems. And then aquatic macroinvertebrates can help determine water quality in your local streams, rivers, ponds, and lakes. So, you know, sometimes we use data readers such as SANS to go out into streams and we can get certain water chemistry readings such as dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, et cetera. But sometimes all you have to do is just take a look at the aquatic macroinvertebrates that are living within the stream system and that'll give us an idea of how healthy a stream is. So we have what's known as the biotic index of water quality. And within this index, we have three different groups. 
Group one are going to have macro invertebrates that need good water quality. Um, they generally are pollution intolerant. So if you have a really nice, beautiful, healthy stream, you're going to find the critters that are in group one pretty commonly. However, when you start to get a little bit of pollution in that stream, that's when these guys start to disappear. Group two is going to have macroinvertebrates that can tolerate, you know, a little bit of pollution. Um, they can tolerate a, a, a wide range of um, different conditions. And most commonly you're seeing like dragonfly nymphs and crayfish um, in this category where they can kind of tolerate that little bit of extra pollution that might be present. However, if you have a stream where the only thing that's present is group three, which is going to be things like leeches, mid, midge fly larvae, etc. Um, that's not good. Um, these macroinvertebrates can tolerate quite a bit of pollution, and that's just a sign that you've got what is basically a trashed creek. Um, the stream has really poor water quality, and all of the species from group one and two are going to be missing. So let's talk about the big three. So three major insect orders are going to be most often referenced for biotic indexes. These are going to be E, P, T. E is going to be for Ephemeroptera, which are the mayflies. P is going to be for Plecoptera, which are the stoneflies. And T is going to be for Trichoptera, which are the caddisflies. So all three of these insect orders are part of group one. So if we have a stream that has all three of these insect orders present, the stream is nice and healthy. If we're missing these insects, then something's probably going on in that stream that we wanna take a look at the water quality for. So starting off with the mayflies, we can see we have the adult up here, and then we have the immature stage, which is known as a nymph. So the nymph is going to be the aquatic stage of the mayfly. So mayflies are an ancient order of insects dating back to the Carboniferous period about 300 million years ago. So we can see on this scale, we have you know, the Mesozoic, when all the dinosaurs were running around doing their thing. Before that, in the Carboniferous period, that's when mayflies showed up. So we're talking about a very old order of insects. And mayflies spend about a year in their nymph stage, but when it comes to the adult stage, they really live fast and die young. Um, some adults are only alive for only five minutes. Well, most of the time, they usually last for, you know, a few hours. Um, ultimately, the main name of the game is you want to breed and produce the next generation of offspring and live fast, die young in that case. So mayfly adults, which are known as imago. So the imago is going to be the adult insect stage that is mature. Um, they have a pair of short antennae, no functional mouth parts, two pairs of wings, and then three tails that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. So here's an example of looking at their wings. So their four wings are going to be that sort of triangular shape that just stands upright and is very distinct in appearance, while the hind wing, the smaller wing back here, can vary in size, so sometimes almost completely absent. And then mayfly adults have sexual dimorphism, so there's differences between males and females. The males have larger eyes compared to the females, and they also have longer front legs than the females. So the males will use their larger eyes to be able to see the females while flying around. And then they have 
the longer front legs so that while they're flying, they're able to hold on to the female for mating during mid-flight. Mayflies are unique from all other extant insect orders due to their sub imago form. So extant, the opposite of extinct, they're still alive. So mayflies are the only insects to molt when they still have wings present. So you can see here, this is the leftover remains from a mayfly that ended up being a sub imago, landed, molted, and molted into the adult stage. So this is really weird to see. Um, again, no insects that are alive today do this besides the mayflies. So what will happen is the mayfly become, when it's um, mature, becomes the sub imago. They typically have a darker coloration to their wings, though it's not always the case. And then when they molt again, they end up having that lighter coloration to their wings. And sometimes the males will have a little bit longer front legs as well. Mayfly nymphs, you can see right here, this is going to be your standard mayfly nymph. They have wing pads on their backs, so the immature insects do not have wings. You can see where the wings will end up appearing when they're adults. They often have three distinct tails, so we can see one, two, three. The outermost tails are going to be known as circe. So these are going to be sensory appendages that they'll use to kind of sense around in case there's any predators that are coming from behind. They can sense it. And then this middle tail is known as the terminal filament. So sometimes these guys can raise up their tails and raise them forward almost like a scorpion and they can assume a defensive positioning with that to kind of ward off predators. In addition, mayfly nymphs are going to have gills of varying numbers and shape that run along their abdomen back here. So that's going to be a key characteristic that we can look at the shape and placement of the gills to help us identify them. And mayflies have a lot of diversity to their body plan. Um, the key thing with these insects, as well as pretty much these, this presentation and the follow-up presentation, are going to be form fits function. So these animals are adapted for the environment that they live in, and you can see that their body plan and the, you know, their different appendages, etc., are shaped to better suit their habitat and their living conditions. So for example, some mayfly nymphs are going to be known as clingers. They're flattened dorsal ventrally, so think flattened like a pancake. And they're going to be living under rocks in the currents of streams. So flattened like a, plant, a pancake. And you'll see that they have very thick muscular legs right here that helps them cling onto the surface of a rock in those rougher water conditions. And even their head is going to be flattened out as well. Some mayfly nymphs are swimmers. So the, these guys are gonna be thin and streamlined in appearance, almost built like a little torpedo. And even their gills are going to be rounded off like that to help reduce drag on their body. They can swim through the water pretty quickly. You'd be surprised how fast they can move. And then some mayfly nymphs are burrowers. So they're going to have these tusks. You can see right here on the front of their mouth. And then they're going to have shovel-like forelegs up here that are going to help them dig through sand and substrate. 
So what they'll do, they'll tunnel into the sand substrate. And when they're down there, they have these really long feathery gills and they'll wave them around and they'll be able to create a current of water that helps to oxygenate their gills through the tunnel system. Some mayfly nymphs are going to be filterers. So they're going to be catching organic particles in the water column using what's known as CD on their forelegs. So this example right here, we can see we have these long bristle-like hairs on the front legs. That is going to be the CD. So CD, it's a weird one when you look at it and trying to pronounce it. So what will happen is these guys are gonna be chilling and they're gonna have their arms waving up in the water column. And as water is passing over them, little pieces of organic matter like algae, et cetera, are going to end up getting caught in those hairs. And then they bring their arms in and they end up just taking off the little organic particles that landed on their CD and feeding that way. And then you get some mayfly nymphs that are just weird. Um, this example, Baytisidae, um, this little mayfly is just looks like a little tank. Um, it's wing pads, you can see they look like little armor plating and they've got these spines that are protruding from the side. So these are helping to protect these guys from predators and they're not the most graceful of creatures, but if you're built like a little tank, you don't necessarily need to be a graceful animal. And then just the general life cycle for the mayfly, starting off as our egg right here. The egg hatches and we get our little baby mayfly sticking down all the way below the surface of the bottom and hiding out down there and feeding. Then when they get big enough, they'll be hanging out on the bottom of the stream on the substrate. And as they grow bigger, they eventually will get to a point when it's time to metamorphosize into the adult stage. So either they'll climb up and out of the water to molt, or they will simply float to the surface and basically turn into a little raft. And either way, the adult subimago pops out and after a little bit of time, it lands down, molts into the adult stage that is fully ready to mate. So again, males have the longer arms than the females. And then eventually reproduce and make more eggs that they will lay in the water and the cycle continues. So now we move on to the stoneflies. So stoneflies, just already looking at them, quite a bit of a different appearance when it comes to the adults. And even the nymphs, you can tell quite a bit of a different shape. So while they're still a primitive group of insects, stoneflies are going to be more advanced than the mayflies. So stoneflies do not have the sub imago form. They go directly from that nymph stage into the adult stage. And then stonefly adults are generally going to be living for about a week or two. So, you know, a little bit longer lived as adults compared to the mayflies. But then the nymphs can live anywhere from one to four years old before they become adults. So example like this, um, giant stonefly right here. These guys can take up to four years before they become adult stoneflies. Stonefly adults generally have two pairs of membranous wings that fold over their back. You can see they've got a lot of veiny structure to their wing as well. And then they have two tails. So if you remember before, 
on the mayfly, we're looking at the Circe. So the stoneflies do not have that middle terminal filament. They only have the two Circe as their little tails. Then just an interesting little fact about the adults. The adults are going to be communicating to each other using drumming sounds with their abdomen. So they'll smack their abdomens against like a rock or a stick, and they'll be able to create these sounds that they'll use to communicate to the opposite sex. So a male, for example, looking at his call, you can see that he starts off pretty loud and then he gets a little bit quieter. And then the female is going to be responding back basically the opposite way where she starts out quietly and she gets louder before he ends up calling back in response. So just a cool little way that these insects are communicating with each other. Looking at the nymphs, stonefly nymphs generally have chewing mouth parts. So you can see right here that we've got some little sharp mouth parts down here for chewing on some insects and maybe some other things, depending on uh, what particular species they are. They have two tails. So again, the Circe that are right here, the sensory appendages. And then they'll have gills on either their head, thorax, or abdomen. And when you look at them from up top, you can kind of see, looks like they have little hairy armpits right here. Those are going to be the gills that you can see from a dorsal shot. If we look at a ventral shot, so underneath, you can see those little hairy armpits underneath there that are going to be the gills on this particular stone fly. Sometimes though, they're on certain um, like genuses, they're not going to be the same as this, like they will completely lack these gills, they might have these tiny little gills around their neck. So it can vary. Um, and this particular one even has little butt gills right down here that they'll use to help breathe underwater. So stonefly nymphs, they're not going to be as diverse in morphology compared to the mayflies and the caddisflies that we'll get to shortly, uh, but they still come in many shapes and sizes. So stonefly nymphs are going to have varying shapes for their wing pads. So we looked at the past one. It kind of had a more blocky appearance with its wing, uh, wing pads. These guys right here can see thinner and more elongate in appearance and kind of pointing directly towards the back of the stonefly. Some stonefly nymphs are going to look like little cockroaches. So Peltiperlidae, look at these wing pads, really wide in shape. And this is going to give the stonefly nymph the appearance of a little cockroach that's going to be scampering across areas that you hopefully don't end up seeing too often um, in your workplace or et cetera. <laughs> Others can grow very large and are covered in armor. So here we have a giant stonefly. So we can see heavily armored wing pads up here. And even the abdomen has quite a bit of armor along here. And these guys get quite big. Um, I've collected individuals that are the size of my finger. Um, and even larger than that. So they get very big, they can be very long lived. And just in general, just really cool critters when you encounter them. And when they are scared of you because you appear to be a big giant predator, they will curl up into a little ball to help defend themselves by exposing that armor to you. And then just looking at their life cycle. So again, pretty similar to the mayfly where they start off as an egg, turning into the nymph when they hatch. And eventually they either float to the surface 
or they crawl out of the water. And instead of having that subimago form, they just molt and metamorphosize directly into the adult of the stonefly stage. And then the adults mate and lay eggs in the water and the cycle continues. Now we move on to the caddis flies. So you can see adult. And then for the immature stage, instead of calling them nymphs, we refer to caddis flies as larvae when they're immature. So caddis flies are more advanced than both mayflies and stoneflies. And they're actually most closely related to moths and butterflies. And when you look at them side by side, you can see it, you know, pretty similar in appearance, um, especially when you look at the moths that fold their wings back against their body like that. Many caddisflies complete one generation within a year. So, you know, starting off as the egg and then going all the way to the adult stage and reproducing, typically within a year. Um, some can take several years before they end up becoming fully mature, while others can just be rapid fire where you have a whole bunch of generations occurring within um, a single year. Caddisfly adults are going to be distinct from main, uh, mayflies and stoneflies in that they've got hairs and scales that are going to be covering their wings. So relatively similar in regards to moths and butterflies that have scales as well. And then some caddisfly adults are also going to have very distinct striking colorations, especially in comparison to other adult uh, aquatic insects. So this particular caddisfly adult that we see here, really beautiful orange, white, black colorations to it. Um, the stoneflies and the mayflies typically don't have very fancy colorations. Um, many caddisflies are typically kind of like, eh, like pale, like not too colorful, but just seeing at least some coloration like that is pretty unique compared to stoneflies and mayflies. Now we move on to the larva. So caddisfly larvae are caterpillar-like and they have a head capsule that is highly sclerotized. So right here, their head capsule. When we say sclerotized, we mean that it's basically thick and hardened like this little armor plate that's basically covering the head. And you can see on the back here, so we have the thorax right here where the legs of the insect are. We have three distinct plates on this caddisfly that are highly sclerotized. So thick hardened plates on the back. And then as we go down the body, we've got little butt hooks right here. So we've got the butt hooks down here that will help anchor the caddisfly in place so that it doesn't end up drifting away or it helps it keep itself anchored into its home, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Caddisfly larvae come in varying shapes and sizes and they have different sclerotization on the thorax. So looking at this example, we've got pretty thin head and thorax up here on the caddisfly. Well, we got a big old chunky abdomen back here. So this is a micro caddis fly in particular. So pretty different looking compared to the last one. And then this caddis fly, when we look at the plates, we can see you've got highly sclerotized plate on that front for pair of, um, bleh, sorry, on the front part of the forex where that uh, first pair of legs are. Then you have right back here, you can see that the plating, you got a little bit of a gap there. So you're starting to have a difference up here. And then on the third segment, we have just these little bands and spots back here that's left of the plating. 
So that just showing you basically how that squaritization differs, and that's something that is used for identification. You can also see this caddis fly has a big old hump right here, and something like that can help secure it within its case. So beyond a shadow of a doubt, the coolest thing about caddis flies is something that they create with silk. So they are able to make cases and retreats. So using their salivary glands, so kind of like how moths are gonna be spinning silk and such like that, these guys are able to spin silk and they'll take little pieces of debris like gravel and such on the stream bottom and they'll make themselves a little case that they live in. And usually they can carry it around with them to and from this different places. Others will end up creating these little nets out of debris or little shelters that they hide in. So generally caddis fly cases consist of materials from the stream benthos or the stream bottom, such as sand, pebbles, gravel, leaves, and sticks. So we can see we've got a caddis fly right here with a case that is, you know, little pieces of sand and maybe some rock in there. Here's one that we've got that is pieces of pebbles and gravel from the bottom of the stream. You can see right there where the silk is helping to keep the case together. Here's one where a caddis fly took some pieces of stick and twig and chopped them up and basically made a little case that looks like a Jenga fort. So really cool stuff there. And then here's an example of a caddis fly that makes a case that looks like a snail shell. So we have an example of convergent evolution where you have two completely different animals that are unrelated from each other that ended up creating some, like evolving something similar in shape. So here we have a caddis fly that has created a case that looks like a snail shell versus the snail itself will produce a shell that looks obviously like a snail shell. So pretty cool case of that evolutionarily happening. You can see our little caddis fly right here poking out from the side. And sometimes why make a snail shell case where you can just take a snail shell that you find and add it to your case directly. So sometimes they're not very picky about what they put on their case to help camouflage and decorate it to protect themselves from predators. Some will even take leaves and they'll end up basically gluing them onto their case to help act as an additional form of camouflage. And then here's just a quick video. There's probably going to be no sound, so don't be surprised if you don't hear anything. But here we have a little caddis fly within its case. And just watching it do its thing. Um, my camera is causing the water current to be a little bit rough on this poor small child. But you can see here's its case. There's the body. You can even see the hump right there. It's got a case made out of little pieces of stick and leaves. And oh no, the water current took it a little bit there, but it was able to get itself back upright and moving again. And then you have other caddis flies that are going to be free living and they're going to be spinning silk nets to capture their prey and other floating debris. So these guys will end up spinning, you can see here, we have our little silk net here that they'll use pieces of woody debris, vegetation, et cetera, to form. And they'll set up shop downstream of a current or within the riffle itself. And as insects end up floating downstream or you have little pieces of debris, 
they get caught within the net and the caddis fly ends up having a little meal to be feasting on. If it's an insect, if it's a piece of debris, you can just add it right onto the setup and just keep expanding what it's got. So really cool setup and just fascinating aspect of these critters just living in the stream, doing their thing. And then again, just looking at the life cycle, very similar to what we were seeing before. So we're starting off as an egg. Then we got our free living caddis fly larva or the cased caddis fly larva. And they end up becoming a pupa. And the pupa ends up, this is one of the differences between the stoneflies and the mayflies. The pupa ends up rising up to the surface and swimming up. And it will basically act like a little raft for the adult to pop up and out of and spread its wings out, get itself adjusted. And then it will take to the sky as an adult where it will mate and then release eggs into the water and continue the life cycle all over again. So why should we care about EPT? EPT taxa are generally very sensitive to water quality changes. So if they, dis if they disappear from the stream, we've got a problem. So they act as the canary in the coal mine. So coal miners used to take canaries down into the mines with them. And if you did not hear the canary singing its song anymore, that's a sign that the gases um, in the cave were or in the coal mine were starting to get dangerous and it was time to get out of there. So it's a case where if we have a stream and we are starting to see less and less of um, the mayflies, the stoneflies and the caddisflies in the stream, then we see, okay, something is happening here where there's probably pollution coming in from somewhere. Like we should do something about this. And you can have streams that are just completely end up getting polluted and you look at something um, like this and you're just like, is this going to have EPT living there? Like, are we going to have a healthy stream system with a condition like this? Like, it's just a case where it's an easy way, like you don't need to look at a stream like this even before like the coloration aspect. You can look at the taxa and get an idea of how bad a stream might be in health wise. And then they also play an important role in the transfer of energy across aquatic and terrestrial systems. So we have an animal that is capable of being underwater in its immature stage where animals of the aquatic ecosystem such as fish, crayfish, other aquatic insects, et cetera, are going to be eating them and transferring energy for the aquatic ecosystem. But then when they become adults and are able to fly up onto land, now you've got a completely different group of predators that are able to eat them, such as spiders and other insects, um, birds, mammals, et cetera, are going to be feeding on these animals so you're taking energy that's from the aquatic ecosystem and transferring it to terrestrial ecosystems. So just very important with being able to have energy moving throughout these different systems. And then EPT taxa are going to be heavily used in recreational activities such as fly fishing. And then they help maintain stable sports fish populations. So if we want to be having healthy like sports fish populations like trout, we want to make sure that we've got healthy insect populations as well so that the fish are nice and fat and healthy for the fishermen who want to be catching them. And the cool thing is fly fishing uses a very specific kind of lore in a sense. So you take a hook and you want to try and mimic an aquatic insect or in the case of the adults, we'll get to that shortly, 
but you want to try and mimic a prey item in the water by just using a hook. So you don't use actual live bait when you're fly fishing. Your goal is that you want to try and mimic the animal that your fish is going to be trying to eat. And this is just a really fascinating thing because it really helps you as you're fishing to just get immersed in nature and really kind of get involved in like the ecosystem and try to understand, you know, what are these fish thinking? What are they feeding on? You know, depending on time of year, they're going to be trying to eat certain looking flies. Um, so it's just a great way to help connect to um, the aquatic ecosystem and get involved. So here's an example of a terrestrial, so a dry fly that sits on the surface of the water. So you have this mimicking a mayfly right here. And the goal is that you want to try and get to land perfectly on the surface so that it looks like an insect that has just hit the surface of the water so that the fish rises up and sees it and then snatches it from the surface of the water. So just wonderful way to just be out in nature and understanding how aquatic ecosystems work. And some of the best fly fishermen are also entomologists, so they're studying insects as well. Now, here's the part that's probably gonna be tricky in the sense that I need to kind of watch the chat and see how things are going. So we're going to be testing your newfound knowledge with a multiple choice scheme. And the idea here is that I'm going to be putting up some pictures of aquatic insects and you just have to answer a simple question. What is this insect or what is this insect adapted to do? So what you can do is just type your um, answers into the chat or into like the question, the Q&A part. Um, and we'll just end up going through and seeing how well you do with it. So let's see how this works from here. So. What is this aquatic insect? So type it into the chat. Is it A, a mayfly, B, a stonefly, or C, a caddisfly? So looking at this aquatic insect, you know, looking at this appearance right here, we can see got two Cersei right here. So let's see. So, so far it looks like people are staying stoneflies. Okay, give it another second. All right, so this is going to be, you're correct, this is a stonefly. So, you can see we've got the two Cersei back here and pretty distinct looking wing pads. So good job, got that one correct. So next one, what is this aquatic insect? Is this a mayfly, a stonefly, or a caddisfly? So it looks like people are going with C, caddisfly. So let's see if that's correct. And that is correct. This is a caddisfly. It's got the very caterpillar-like body, highly sclerotized head. And we got our little butt hooks back here as well. Good job. All right. What is this aquatic insect? Is this one a mayfly? Is this a stonefly or is this a caddisfly? So remember, 
looking at things like the tail, gills, wing pads, etc. So type it into the chat. So I've got one from Mayfly. I got another from Mayfly. And you are correct. This is indeed a Mayfly. Fantastic job. Now, huh. What is this aquatic insect? Is this a Mayfly? Is this a stonefly? Or is this a caddis fly? So take a second and look at everything on this one. So we've got two Circe, then gills back here. Hmm. What do we think this one is? So I've got mayfly and stonefly, and one person saying that it's a day-to-day -day mayfly. Wow, nice, <laughs> going in the details there. Um, this one, this is a tricky one. This is a mayfly. So this, this one I wanted to put on here to show that nature will always end up throwing you a curveball, and giving you something that kind of goes against the norm. Um, so this is a mayfly that has no terminal element in the middle here, or on um, terminal filament. So the way that you can still tell that it's a mayfly is that it still has these gills that are located on the abdomen like that. So that's a trick one. Um, as far as, um, particularly what, I think it's what genus it would be, genus would be, no, sorry, um, family would be Heptagenidae. So this would be a Heptagenidae mayfly. I think this is the genus Eophorus. So I'd have to double check that one. But, um, so that one's a tricky one. And then finally, what lifestyle does this insect have? Is this going to be a filterer, a burrower, or a swimmer? So remember, let's first figure out, okay, we see three tails on here. So we also see some cool stuff going on up here. So what do we think? this is. So I see one person saying burrower. Yep. So this one is going to be a burrowing mayfly. And the thing that's giving it away are going to be the tusks right in here. So um, these guys don't quite have the shovel-like front legs um, like the one that we saw earlier, but you know, still the tusks are going to be the one that help gives it away that this is a burrowing uh, mayfly. So overall, this is going to be concluding the first part of this presentation. On Wednesday at 4 p.m., we're going to be learning about freshwater mussels, which I'm going to tell you right now, most people think that freshwater mussels are just like living rocks. I am going to blow your mind when you listen to the life cycle of a freshwater mussel. So that one I highly recommend coming not only for that, but we're also going to be going over my favorite animals, which are the crayfishes. So at this point, here's just some, you know, miscellaneous stuff. Like many of these pictures are from all over the internet. 
um, as well as a few of my own. Um, I don't own all of these pictures and I give credit to all of those. Um, if you're interested in reaching out to me, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have through email. Um, and then we also have, you know, floor is open for any questions right now. Oh, um, yeah, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a lot of these, a lot of the first and second taxa, or first and second level and third level, refer to uh, pollution tolerant. Mm -hmm. And is that is that usually um, referring to the lack of dissolved oxygen as the major pollutant and therefore organic matter? It'll be. So that's dependent. So some of these um, insects are going to be well adapted to living within areas with low dissolved oxygen. Um, the big thing with that, when you're looking at different like pollutants in the stream, that would be looking at like phosphorus and nitrogen levels. Um, salinity would be another one that would cause um, potential issues um, dissolved oxygen can play a role, though, depending on the species. Um, so it's kind of just dependent on the particular, like, the habitat. Because um, just for example, um, back in my home area of Pennsylvania, there is a lake that um, I go to with, like, a little wetlandish area off to the side. And that area kind of has a little bit of stagnant water to it, but you can find burrowing mayflies, like big burrowing mayflies that are living in that area. Um, so, and even in like, um, like some areas that I've seen like separate from the stream in um, the Allegheny National Forest area, um, I was finding some really cool aquatic insects in those like little like pools that are off to the side of the stream that um mm -hmm. the water yeah. like you'll have oxygen levels dropping during that time right oh interesting good thank you mm -hmm. and i'll actually put in the chat so this is this will be a link that will show up in um i think this is it it's either this I think it's macroinvertebrates.org or it's either macroinvertebrates.org or .com. Um, that's where the majority of my pictures for the aquatic insects came from. And that is, oh, it is one of the best ways to identify aquatic insects that you might be collecting. Um, really great visual source to really like hone in because you can look at like picture keys where it's just like drawings and that will help. But when you see, like when you have both available to you to compare, like a website like macroinvertebrates, um, I'm pretty sure it's .org, is just fantastic and really helps hone in on the details that you'd be looking at. Super. And did anyone have any other questions then? So if you have some of the um, midge flies or the left-handed snails, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. um, the what well, those would be that could both breathe with gills and come out of the water too. So mm -hmm. if you have some of those tolerant, very tolerant organisms, it doesn't necessarily mean that the water's bad. 
you'd have to look at the whole group, right? A whole bunch of insects to see. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but if you only had leeches and bloodworm midges and chironomids and things like that, then you would know that you've mm -hmm. got problems. Exactly. So, because yeah. it, it's very important because you will still find, like, in, like, healthy stream systems, you still will find all of those groups roaming around and doing their thing. Um, especially the... Um, I always pronounce it wrong. Um, Chironomids, like they, they're just always, I, I feel like they're always <laughs> yeah, present no yeah. matter where you go. Right, um, right. But um, yeah, and, and it can also depend on just the system itself um, because, you know, you can find like aquatic insects in places that just completely like dumbfound you. Um, one that people don't, think about a lot are roadside ditches um <laughs> roadside ditches can have really really cool aquatic species living in them and uh, particularly crayfish but um i have found um really cool caddis flies living in roadside ditches before so like huh. it's just you just get like it's just a case where, um, like, if you haven't, just, like, you can take, like, look at the insect fauna of, like, a wetland, a sh like, a stream, a large river, and, like, a roadside ditch, and just do a comparison between them and kind of see how everything is different. And it's just fascinating to see um, how much changes. and always making sure that you sample, especially for the bugs, you always want to sample all available habitats. So like woody debris, the undercuts of banks in particular, are really good for getting like dragonfly nymphs, um, like mm. under rocks, etc. Like, yeah. oh man, aquatic, aquatic insects are so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Okay. I think we might be good, Britta. <laughs> Is that the unfortunate thing of not being able to, like, I think I might have heard her for a second. Can you hear me now? I'm on a, Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> I, can, I can hear Britta, too. It required multiple computers and <laughs> different logins, but here I am. And then I was scared to start talking in case it went or something. <laughs> Anyways, now you're thank good. Thank you so much, Patrick, for doing this. And no problem. Otter, it's lovely to hear you too. Oh, great, we, great to be back with you, Britta. <laughs> uh, we miss, I miss getting to work with you more regularly, but so glad yeah. you could be here tonight. And, yep. Um, and all our other well, folks as well. So jumping on the local. Um, Friends of the Palmer River because uh, Dighton Rehoboth lost their you know, Tabitha I and know. their Envirothyme program. So a real sad loss. But we'll uh, we'll see if we can keep learning from our watershed here in, uh, in Rehoboth. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And let, let us know if you find some kids who want to be on a team. So. Okay. Good. Great. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, Patrick, and we'll uh, see you and probably some, maybe some of these people again on Wednesday. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Sounds great. Take, Take care. care. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.